Yo, excuse me, Miss Lynn. Yeah. Have you ever seen a show with a couple on the mic with bad content and it don't come out right? We tight. They ain't never tight. And that's not polite. Am I lying? No, you're quite right. Well, tonight on this very mic, you're about to hear. We, we swear, swear the, the best, best podcast, podcast of the year. So, so. Here we go. Scream Bravo. Also, also if you, you didn't, didn't know, this is our show. Hey, I like that. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to America 20 to Life. I'm your host, Mike Lynn, here with my beautiful wife and co-host, Erica Lynn. What's up, babe? What's up, y'all? It's our new studio, y'all. If you hear any technical difficulties, make sure y'all let us know. Uh, We're just kind of working the kinks out. Uh, But we got a very special show today. Uh, We have uh, Sherry Pruitt that will be on the show uh, speaking on her son, uh, Richard Pruitt, who was killed seven years ago in her... uh, I don't know, her her fight with LPD and the investigative units of them uh, to try to figure this situation out. But also we have Judy Booker on the show uh, today to speak on her son, uh, her grandson, Timothy Minor III, who was killed uh, just about a month ago uh, on Birchfield and having the same situation. And so tonight's show will just basically be about, um, we field a lot of these calls is basically what I can say. I, I speak to mothers on a daily that have lost somebody to gun violence in the city. And a lot of them have the same conversation and the same struggle. They're trying to get answers. Uh, you know, all the way back to Shirley Michener was one of our first shows that we did of a mother who was just trying to get answers uh, from the police department and the prosecutor's office and couldn't get any information. Um, so, you know, I think it's important that we highlight the dysfunction uh, that goes on down there and, and, and people that we... Um, you know, obviously pay a lot of money to do their job. And uh, it seems to be that when it comes to the South and the town or black and brown lives that uh, for whatever reason, they're incompetent to do that. So we're going to have that conversation today uh, in conversation I've had with Judy. I've had I mean, I've heard some disgusting things that have been said to her uh, conversations that have been had with her uh, from some people that are in power that shouldn't definitely be acting like that towards a mother who's grieving. Uh, and this is not a this is not a one off situation or, or some type of a situation where it's just her. So somebody said voice is low. Let me turn it up. How about that? How's that sound? Um, can you hear me now? Let me get a thumbs up if that mic sounds better for you. I can see that it looked a little low, but let me know if that sounds better for you. Um, but uh, the conversation that I've heard come out of these mothers uh, with conversations they've had with officials, whether or not it be elected officials or even our chief of police has been disturbing. Uh, I mean, to say the least, I just couldn't even imagine um, losing somebody uh, right before we went on live. My son came here just to check on us and check out the building and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I just think about that all the time and it, and it doesn't have to reach my front porch for me to want to get involved to try to help these people uh, find answers. So I feel like if we find answers and catch murders, then, you know, that that definitely takes uh, takes some of those people off the street that could possibly murder one of our family members. Um, so anyways, what's what's some other news before we get to that? Uh, we're going to bring Sherry Pruitt on in about, I believe, 10 minutes. So at 8.15, Sherry's going to come on and, ha- and give us a conversation. She's been going through it for the longest of people that I know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've spoken to, you know, Mikey McKissick, who now has a $50,000 reward out for the murders of his family. Oh, uh, I wanted to highlight, too. Shirley Michener's family has now um, gotten around $10,000. You got to turn that mic for, towards you. Um, a reward, you basically, to find information about, you know, her son. So we've got families that are raising a whole lot of funds um, just to try to find out what happened and, and kind of get traction on these things. And what you'll hear is a lot of these mothers, a lot of these families are advocating not just for themselves, but for each other and for others. And that's kind of where we come in because it's a long road. And Sherry has, again, been doing this for seven years and she advocates so hard for for her son, but also for other families. And she'll talk a little bit about how she does that and why. Um, yeah. And their experiences. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we've 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 have uh, we have garnered relationships with a lot of these mothers just because we're a person that we're you know we're a group that will listen. I think a lot of that has to do with that. I mean, when Shirley Michener 
uh, lost Brandon Michener, I, I know that she was screaming loud for a very long time for anybody just to listen and pay attention to what's going on and all the kind of questions that she has surrounding that, that what we believe to be as a murder. And uh, nobody would listen to it. And so, you know, since she came on our show back in, I believe, May of last year, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, uh, So Dead Podcast just did a podcast about it. Uh, there was I think a it was last special. week. There was yeah. a YouTube special. Um, you know, this conversation has been coming back up and a lot of evidence that we seen that t at that point in time uh, that made us come to the conclusion. Yeah, this looks like it could have been a murder. Like this doesn't look like just somebody fell down a, a side of a, a building or, or excuse me, the side of a um, river, you know, bank. a river bank. This looks like somebody pushed him. This looks like there's an incident that happened here. The problem is, and it even it was even that conversation then was that why aren't they looking into it? Why aren't they calling people in and questioning them? You know, uh, one one major um, one major issue that I find a lot of in the conversation that I have with these mothers is that they know the killers. They know the person. In most cases, like these families know exactly who killed their family, but they can't get the police to investigate it. They can't get the police to pull them in and question them. So we see like on the media or excuse me, on the news all the time or, you know, in movies and so on. Like I, I can just say as a, as a, somebody who who's committed crime and I've been to jail, uh, you know, they would pull me in like they would pull me in. I was going through the questioning process no matter what, no matter if I wanted to or not. They have like ability to do like a 72 hour hold on somebody for investigations where they can pull you in, interrogate you until you lawyer up. And then if they have enough evidence or don't have enough evidence, that's the point where they have to let you go. But when they're not even doing that mm -hmm. and these families are telling us that they're not even doing that process, they're not even bringing them in to have that questionnaire, you know, to pull them in to find out what, what you know, a lot of times something that I've found is the people that hold the burden of murder or those type of things, it's. It's aching in them, and sometimes all they need is just a it's like a, a position to be able to tell their truth. Like it's it's so crazy when we watch First Forty Eight. Like people come That's in right. there and they just get in there and they spill it all. Like just give me a cigarette and some McDonald's, and I'm about to tell it all. It's because it's been eaten on them. Killing a person is not something easily stomached. It's not something that people can just do and then go about their life and go to the park and play with their kids and you know whatever the case is. It's something that eats on you for a couple different reasons. First of all, you took a life. But secondly, you always got to look over your shoulder. Murder does not have any statute of limitations. You don't get to get over it in 20 years. You're like, ah, I murdered somebody, such and such and such. A lot of the reasons why, uh, you know, you know, people eventually come forward or, you know, when they're questioned, finally just say, OK, because it's been eaten on. They ain't been able to sleep. They haven't been able to live a normal life. It's like they just want to get it over with a lot of times. But if you're not even bringing them in to have that conversation. Right. If you're not even bringing them in to have the conversation, how would you know whether or not they knew anything? Uh, so we're going to have that conversation with Judy, who has a lot of information as it pertains to that with her similar with her particular case, but also Sherry Pruitt, uh, who I've had long conversations with. She's actually partnered with the Village Lansing uh, with Angelo's gift, which you can talk more about. But I, I witnessed a Zoom call that you were on with like, what, six mothers mm -hmm. who all lost somebody to violence mm -hmm. uh, of some sort. And listening to those to those stories and those testimonies was just heartbreaking. And it was like, I know why I do what I do. I know why I am advocating for this. I know why I'm talking on this. Um, but what it also did to me when I was listening to them speak was like, I was just thinking like, people need to hear this because there's too many people that sit on the couch because it's not their family or it's not in my neighborhood or I live too far away from anything happening like that from, to me. But when you listen to the stories of these mothers, they all kind of felt that way. They all thought that same thing. My son isn't involved or my son doesn't have this or my son's not doing that or he's not in this area. And, and then, that's why and then they start happens. advocating for others because they realize that, you know, that's a human nature type, you know, trait is to always think it can't happen to me. We say that about young people, that young people think that, right. but we all do. People do that. That is something that is almost like a default coping mechanism to have that, you know, blissful ignorance that it can't happen to me. Um, something else, you know, Miranda came in and said, unless you deal with a bastard like the one who killed my son, even if it's not the perpetrator, say that the perpetrator is not who is going to talk, is not going to speak, right? It's someone around them. It's a witness. It's right. someone that can't stomach what they know or what they saw. We're not even questioning them. There are witnesses. Like, there has to be a, a effort. I mean, really, really good effort into solving these cases. And it takes a lot more than just having surveillance video and fingerprints. Sometimes you're not gonna get that. You know, that's why 
it's called an investigation. That's why there's yeah. interrogations and, you know, you have to talk to witnesses. And what we a huge strain I've seen is they won't even talk to the witnesses well, or, you know, things like that. They don't have time. Right. Because they're too busy. Right. And then we're trying to defund them. So they need more money to do these things. Right. But I don't I don't necessarily believe that to be true. I think that if our focus is to stop crime, we understand that police don't stop crime. They show up and they take reports on crime that already happens. So you ask these mothers, do they want more police on the streets to take notes on their family's murder? Or would you rather have uh, more people making sure that the murderers aren't in the mind state to kill somebody? I think they're going to say that if I had it all to do over again, I would want to make sure that the people that killed my son either had help so that they didn't end up doing that. Either you did good investigatory work and caught them way before they ended up murdering a family member of mine. If you think about this aspect, when we have more patrollers on the streets turning people into criminals, then you do people investigating the people who already committed crime. That's a, that's an imbalance. This is where we talk about reimagining or defunding in these type of senses and i shouldn't even say reimagining because we don't want to reimagine policing we already understand the aspects of that but when we talk about defunding if we're not if if, if the city of lansing is not going to defund then let's flip how you do things at least we know that this year they're not going to defund matter of fact they've actually added money to the budget mm -hmm. so we know you're not going to do that then let's 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 figure out a way to when you have murders out here that the whole neighborhood know they are murder. I mean, literally since this situation on Birchfield happened, I've had like three people be like, yeah, that's such and such as this at my house or this, that the, it's like, you know, how, how can this be that the streets understand who did this, but the police aren't going to investigate it because they don't have enough money uh, to investigate these things. I just don't understand what we give $47 million for them to do. I mean, $47 million. I have to beg somebody you know, like, I just can't imagine with the little bit of salary they paid me at the at the fire department, if I told them, hey, I need more money to go fight a fire at your crib. Mm -hmm. I can't show up for work tomorrow because we don't have it. I don't have enough. You're just terrible at your job. That's why the conversation is so important to say that there is there are so many arenas that are, are defunded um, and everyone somehow figures out how to make it work. Right. Even the fire department, okay. There's oh, they make it work with absolutely nothing. That exactly. Their budget, their budget is a third, le a third uh, less than what the city or the police department is. Mm -hmm. And would we say it's any less or more important, et cetera? No, it's not a war of what's more important. What ends up happening is they use fear mongering to make sure that we feel like we're in need of services that we're not even actually getting. So that's a huge point to make is that we talk about bigger budgets and say, well, if this will, if this happens, this will happen. Um, there's a difference between correlation and causation. And if you were to defund the police budget to put back in the community and, you know, Chief Green constantly tells us that if you do that, then there is going to be more rapes and murders. His words, not he mine. He did say that. Um, his words, not mine. Yeah. And that is the literal, the literal definition of propaganda. There is no data. There's no evidence to support that specifically in Lansing. Right. So when you say, when you, you say things like that, it makes people like us who are, out here well they make us you think know, that like the they, police are batman <laughs> like batman always shows up in the alley and stops some rape or stops some mugging hap mm -hmm. from happening police aren't that if you call the police right now and tell them that your house is actively being broken into it may take them an hour to get there and then they'll say well it's because we're we're on we're not we don't have enough manning and so on and so forth i don't believe that yeah i it's... just think they prioritize what they do because if you live in grossbeck and you call for that mm -hmm. same call they will be there mm -hmm. they will be there right right to second there's certain, is definitely triaging of responses. I well, think. the triaging of responses is a lot about what we're about to talk about with Sherry and Judy, because that's exactly the scenario with the murders that are happening in the south end of town. It is a war zone out here. I've been on council every day for a year and a half expressing this is this issue uh, in, in talking about this. Nobody took any, uh, you know, any concern like it just didn't matter to them. I mean, they were silent on these on these aspects. And but happened. I think that if that if that same murder rate was happening, not on the south side, but maybe on the west side, Delta Township type of area, this would be a high alert. Mm -hmm. This would be like bring in all everything that we have and mm -hmm. let's put everything that we can back into this to stop it from happening. And then let's start to to investigate and make sure that we don't like I, for instance, I, you know, it's really con it's concerning to me uh, that there's council members that have actually been victims of violence that aren't as, as pressed about this, but it's not happening to them, right? Mm -hmm. It's happening to us down here. There's a level of bias, right. as with all things, right? 
there's a level of bias because if it was Morris River Drive, if it was the Gross Beck area, if it was any area in which it has been deemed to be those people can, I don't know, make an impact on support or networking or favors or whatever you want to call it, if they have a little bit more impact downtown, is that where they want to, you know, downtown LPD wants to make more of an impact? Right. That's what it looks like. That's what it feels like. That's what we are experiencing as right. people. And there has been a council member that's gotten very upset with this. And as, as most recently as Saturday, I believe it was, spoke on it very publicly mm -hmm. on his Facebook page. We're going to bring that in here today, too. But right now we're going to bring on Sherry Pruitt, uh, Richard Pruitt's uh, mother, who was killed seven years ago uh, by gun violence as well. This and she July has been, will be seven years. Yeah, she's been on a fight uh, ever since to find out. I shouldn't say find out because she already knows, but to bring justice to these killers. So, Sherry, welcome in. Can you hear me? Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Can good. hear you. Can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, one second. I'm getting some feedback. All right. You let us know how we, we, as long as we sound good to you, I think you're getting the sound right on you. You sound good to me. Okay. That's better. Yeah, I don't know where the feedback was coming from. Um, let me get you positioned on the screen here. Uh, let's see. Let's get you bigger here. Boom, there you go. Welcome, Sherry. Welcome, Sherry. I'm already big enough. Mike. Was that too big? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? <laughs> so tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Tell the people a little bit about your story. Um, you know, we know, but can you tell the people, you know, uh, Richard's right. story and what, what was going on with that? Um, August 16th, 2014, my son had came home from at secrets nightclub with his brother sister all of them had their significant others they came home to me and there had been an altercation at secrets nightclub before richard came home as he came in the house he was in the house for a few minutes and looked out the window because i thought he had went back outside and seen someone shoot into my home I ran down the stairs, not knowing that Richard was hit, and ran outside to chase the shooter while I was calling 911 on the phone. I came, about that time that I got connected to 911, my daughter came outside and said that Richard had been shot. We kept him in the hospital for five days before we took him off life support and donated his organs. Um, we know all of the players involved from the initial call to the shooter showing up at the house. Everyone knows, but nothing has been done. And this has been almost seven years. I don't know, as I've said before, um, if it was the fact that Richard had a record because they like to bring that up. If it was the fact that he was a young black man if it was the fact that he had gang affiliations, um, meaning the police deemed him and his associates a gang. And when they asked me about it the day that Richard was shot, they said, you know, does he have gang affiliation? And I said, no. And they started naming names. And I said, the kids that come to my house on the holidays and eat the leftovers, you know, that's not a gang. That's a group of young men that are, you know, best friends. That doesn't make them a gang. So in the police, in the beginning, in the police eyes, um, it was gang affiliated. But we know otherwise. Right. It's been, it's definitely been a struggle. So what, what is your talk a little bit about that with the struggle and kind of your experience up to this point with all of that with law enforcement with trying to get the investigation going the traction and being a cold case for so long um the initial detective on the case is now retired he was amazing I called anytime I messaged him anytime I thought of something it didn't matter what time it was I could text him, I could call him, I could email him, and he was Johnny on the spot, literally. He retired, and it 
went into the hands of another detective who was in this unit at that time, not knowing that there was only one detective on the cold case unit. Now we're on to three, and she's got 85 cases, plus her cases that are coming. She does um, different things with the department. So she's overwhelmed. They're saying that they don't have a budget. I, the reason that I go to the newspaper, I go to the news is because people don't know, the community doesn't know where the funding is going or how much funding is available that could be allocated in different areas. You know, as we've said before, when you say defund the police, they think that means take the police off the streets. That's not what it means. It means to allocate funding to other areas. I pulled up on a scene down the street the other day and there was eight officers and a little hundred pound girl that they were talking to. It doesn't take eight officers. So I'm, it's, it's very frustrating. And as we've talked about before, this is happening every day. I'm reaching out to parents almost on a daily basis. You know, if you need anything, let me know. If, if there's anything I can do, let me know. It's never ending. And there's no consequences. Let me ask you a question. Um, you, have you seen the new police uniforms? They got these all blacked out uniforms now. You know yeah, that they spent, they spent $250,000 to reuniform the whole department. Not because the, all the uniforms were ratted and tatted and they needed new ones and this was like a necessity to save lives, right? But it's because they wanted to militarize the police department. Now they've got like their, you know, all of these, uh, you know, like they got basically a whole suit that has like their magazines and ammunition and cuffs all on their chest and it looks really militarized. That $250,000, right? Because AT&T came and gave $10,000 to the cold case unit. They did this big press release and it was like this big check they held up and it was like, ah, oh, we need more money. We don't have enough money, 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 money. But you had enough money to spend $250,000 on the uniforms. And now there's something else that we should know. They bought a tactical bus, which we need a tactical bus, right? We absolutely needed that. So they go buy a tactical bus for some you know, some astronomical amount of money. But then they realize we don't have anywhere to house this tactical bus that we didn't need. So now we have to build a garage. Garage, $250,000, $500,000 in unnecessary stuff. When we have shootings every single day out here, cold case files piling up, but they keep talking about they need money, know what they need to do. Also, there's the budget that we went through last year. It was so ridiculous. The amount of money they spend on leasing these vehicles, the amount of money they spend on a shooting range rental. It costs, you buy a piece of land for $30,000 and put a shooting range on it like that. No problem. You're the police department, but they rent a shooting range. That's where they go. They rent one. And it costs over $100,000 a year for them to have a shooting ability to shoot there. So these are the type of wasteful spending that uh, that we're talking about that, you know, they keep talking about they don't have enough money. You got way more money than you need to. And so, you know, that's the aspect, too, is like, do you really need that amount of money? And if you do have that amount of money, couldn't you at least put it into a place where we can actually solve the worst crime committed by man? Murder? Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you didn't give those figures, people wouldn't know. Right. We, I mean, we are privy to that information as the public, but and last summer when I was featured in the paper, I went to buy the newspaper and I told the cashier that my son was, in, oh, what did he do? He was a victim of a homicide. He did absolutely nothing. You know, and I'm not saying he was an angel, but at that time he did absolutely nothing. Surely and I explained, I absolutely. Sorry, and I explained to her, 
It's not. It doesn't matter. Please None don't. Please don't. Do that. <laughs> I know you don't do that. <laughs> you know I always do. I know, I but don't do. do that because it doesn't matter. You're I don't. It doesn't forces. matter unless it was a right. unless it was a uh, a self defense shooting. It doesn't matter what right. they did prior to that. You know, and this is the narrative Very that true. they press Very on true. us. And even we say it. We feel like we have to defend. Like we like, you know. You know, they might have did. It doesn't matter what they did prior That's to true. that moment. That That's person true. that killed them is the only person that did an act that was wrong at that moment. That's all that matters, right? right. Yeah. So just know that, that I, I support. This, this has been being brought up to me. He, he used to tell me the same thing all the time. That man left his house with a gun came to your house and shot your son period it doesn't matter what your son did before that moment so i know this is ingrained in me for the last seven but point being the cashier that the cold case unit only had one detective and no this is something that the public however we get it out there if we do interviews and we're on the day to life we're in the newspaper I will, until my last breath, defend, because it's not just my son. There's dozens of other people. There's cases that have been closed that shouldn't be closed just to push it to the side, get it off the desk. Right. You know, um, it's, it's insane. It's insane. I think people have to be reminded because this is a reminder to anyone that has those thoughts about questioning anything that's irrelevant to someone being murdered. None of those things, none of those things matter. No one, that includes the police, no one gets to be judge, jury, and executioner in any situation in any way, shape, or form. Period. And I wanted to know, Angela um, earlier had said they also doubled their gun budget as well. In this budget. Yeah, in this budget, they doubled their gun budget. So, Good to know. Sure, I can't wait to have you in studio because we're having like a bad connection issue right now with the uh, with. Are we okay? Yeah, with the Zoom, but uh, I can't wait to have you in studio. You know, we're gonna bring you in and, and have a whole conversation on this because it is so important. And plus, you like sis because you know we're we're all networked and intertwined now with all of this. So absolutely, we're definitely gonna bring you I, in. I look the studio. forward to it. Absolutely, I look forward to it. Perfect. And is there anything else that you wanted to kind of touch on? I know you have an important date coming up. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Sunday would have been, Sunday the 13th would have been Richard's 24th birthday. Every year we have a big celebration of life at Washington Park from 12 to 5. Anyone is welcome. Food, memories, we have raffles. Um, a lot of small businesses in the area donate. I started a nonprofit and now by the grace of God, I've teamed up with you guys and Angelo's gift foundation helps crime victims and their families pay for different things through the grieving process that crime victims compensation doesn't take care of. Right on. I can't wait to see you. So all five, come on out. I say this all the time that I can't wait to see you all work, but I think that's a, oxymoron because then if you work that means somebody has lost somebody but i've seen you all in action and i think one of the things that i i really can't wait to see you all do is the uh group talk because i when i was you know hearing you all talk as you know the mothers it was just i felt like it was it was supportive it was a supportive environment and i think that a lot of mothers just need that you know that are going through this and you you guys are providing that so that's awesome they need to know they're not alone at the end of the day, there's somebody else out there that's going through the same thing. Absolutely. All right, we love you, Sherry. We'll definitely have Thanks, you back. Thanks, guys. Love you, too. All right, take care. All right, I don't know what the problem was with the connection. Uh, I don't think it was on our end. It sounded more or less like it was a connection over there, but that's fine. We're going to have Sherry in the in the room. Um you know, at some soon, point in time. Yes. Yeah, soon. A broader so, conversation. This is a complex and ongoing conversation. So, yeah. No shortage of discussions that need to be had. All right. So here we go. We're going to be bringing on Judy. But first, I want to uh, play a, a snippet uh, that came from WLNS. Um, 
in the beginning and it's just got some visuals and I'm going to read to you all uh, because the audio wouldn't come up, but I'm going to read to you all uh, what they stated in here. And um, here we go. The Lansing Police Department was on scene at a shooting at the 4200 block of Birchfield Avenue in Lansing. Officers found a 23 year old man and a 22 year old man was seriously injured from gunshot wounds. Um, yeah, I know I turned it on. Um, you messed me up here. We're seriously injured for gunshot wounds. The victims were transported to a local hospital and they are both listed in a critical condition. Obviously, we know uh, the past that uh, both uh, young men died. Uh, neighbors said that uh, they heard about 10 gunshots and saw two people being transported to the hospital. Investigators remain on the scene and information suggests the victim and suspects knew each other. Um, so about that, you gotta put the headset on so you can hear. I um, welcome in Judy Booker, the grandmother of uh, Timothy Minor III. Um, I I got reached out to to have a conversation with you because you were having some issues uh, through BLM. And we had a conversation and you told me some of the things that were going on. And I want to give you an opportunity to speak uh, from your perspective of what's what's transpired up to this point. Um, and you've kind of heard us coming into this process, you know, about the policing and how that's gone. And you've you told me some stories that I just I want the people to hear about, you know, your interactions with them. Uh, so just walk us through, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with speaking on. But just walk us through the process of what, what's going on here. You're going to probably have to move closer, or bring it closer to you. There you go. My grandson was uh, shot and killed May 16th at 1237 on a Sunday. And uh, when I got to the scene, uh, they was taking him to the hospital. When I got there, they said that they was transporting him to the hospital. So when I got to the hospital, um, they, they wouldn't let me in, so, but I was determined. So they did let me in. And so they t sit me in the room and they just, I sit there for me like for five hours, but it wasn't that long. When they came in, I asked them, what was, is, was he dead? They said, no, the, the nurse told me her name was, his name was Matt. He said, no, we got him down to surgery. They're working on him. But that was a lie. He was already dead. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was already dead. He was in the room next to me dead. Oh. So when I, um, when they did finally let me in the room, they was waiting on me to say that they can have his uh, organs, but I told him no. So when I told him that, they took him off the machine. So, oh. And I, I called the detective. And everybody know who did it. Everybody seen them. It was on a Sunday. It was 80 degrees, so everybody was outside. It's 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 really hard for me because it's in my backyard. Um, the first officer that was on the scene, it was a lady. She looked at him and said, is this Timothy Minor? And the lady said, yes. She stepped back. And then another officer came for, to his assistance. So the police, to me, they're not doing their job, or you know, it's a lot of questions that I I want answered. When I called Chief Green, he wanted to know how I got his phone number. It didn't matter how I got it. I got it. You told me that when you had contacted him, it was the first words you said was, "How did you get the number?" Yes, yeah. And how did I get the number? It didn't. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I just want to know what's going on with the case. He said he was kind of familiar with it, but not too familiar with it. He was a, uh, he sent it to his uh, captain, mm -hmm. and so he was going to have the captain to call me. So when the captain did call me, he was like, "Well, we need somebody to uh, to be an eyewitness to tell us who did the shooting." You know, I mean, everybody was out there seeing it. It's door cams out there, so you you, you guys know who did it. Mm -hmm. I just don't think they care. Yeah. Yeah. So. Today, we also had a conversation with uh, Kara Berg, who wrote an article with Lansing State Journal, and it was rather disturbing to your family. Yes, it was very disturbing to my family, not just to my family, but to the community, because they wrote a story that just, they was just saying, like, well, they deserve what they got. You know, they didn't ask me any questions. How was it? How was he as a kid? Or what did he do? Or what did he like? They just wrote what they what they got from the police mm -hmm. and they didn't ask me was it right some of it was right but some of it was wrong i want to read I a portion thinking. of uh of what they had written yeah. and okay. i want you because you've told me about this situation mm -hmm. 
uh, one of the one of the things that they had talked about was the shooting occurred. She was, she talks about um, uh, Timothy being uh, escaping while being transported from Eaton County, and you've told me about that that story. And so the way that they say it is like, uh, you know, he just he ran and jumped out and took he off and so on and so forth. And and why I think this is so important is because it's a conversation that we all have all the time. Because as parents, when our young people are messing up, a lot of times we go and we ask cool. for help. And they tell us, well, they're not no help until they commit a crime, right? Right. And so this was kind of the same scenario that you were in, and you were asking for help and help and help and help, mm-hmm. and they let and they let you down. Ultimately, they let you down because now you know your grandson is dead. Yeah. Can you tell us about that that scenario and what all that you had tried to do, you know, to get help before an incident like this took place? Before he even got into the system, I seen him. I seen him going that way, and I used to pray and I asked God to help me. So one Monday morning, I was I got up, I went to the courthouse on Kalamazoo Street, and it wasn't even open. So when they opened, it was 8 o'clock. I was sitting in the lobby crying, and I asked. Somebody came out and asked me. I said, I need help. I need help with my grandson because of the, he's, he's, he's going in the wrong direction. So the lady came back. She went back into her office, and then she came back out. She said, we can't help you because he's not in the system. He, he, at that time, he wasn't in the system. He had gotten into trouble or mm-hmm. anything. So I was trying to get, when she told me I, that they couldn't help me, so I had to go back to the school and ask them, why are y'all not putting truancy tickets? So I had to make them put truancy tickets on him, send them to me, and the lady told me, she said, well, you're the one that's going to be responsible for I'm like, at this point, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I just need some help with my grandson. So when I got the truancy tickets, that's when I was able to get him in the system. Mm. I had to I had to force them to put truancy tickets instead of trying to help before that mm-hmm. to get him in the system to try to get some help. So I, I feel like the, the system failed him, mm-hmm. you know. And with the juvenile, when, it, when they said he escaped from the juvenile, that mm-hmm. never happened. I can remember it was at 5.30 on a Wednesday. I was working at the city rescue mission. His probation officer came to me, called me, and said that we have to transport Tim Minor out of the juvenile system, out of the juvenile home. I'm like, well, where are you going to take him? Well, we're going to take him to Clinton County. So not knowing that he's taking him with his co-defender. So they t- went to he went to the juvenile home. They dressed him out of his street clothes. They gave him his backpack, and they gave him his hat and his shoes and everything and, and put him in his car and took him to McDonald's on Cedar. Now, why, and told him, don't leave, don't get out the car. Put a child lock on. These are two 14-year-old boys that they transported together mm. and put a child lock on and say, I'll be right back. I'm going to get you a hamburger. Now, what kid wouldn't leave? Mm. Yeah. So when they called me back, he called me right back about 530 and said that Tim is in trouble now. He's going to escape from the juvenile home. I'm like, how did he do that? Well, I took him to McDonald's. Why would you take them to McDonald's? Right. Why would you take them and put them in their street clothes and then take them to McDonald's to treat them before you take them where you're supposed to take them? So when I made a big stink about that, then they tra- then they changed the policy of how to transport the juveniles. Mm. But before then, they didn't say, well, the probation officer Messed was up. involved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. they just put it all on my grandson, right? which never happened like that. And I'm thinking any 14-year-old Thank at that you. time with that mind is going to get, get out the car and leave. Absolutely. Exactly. That's why the responsibility is on the adult. And the adult. But another Period. thing that, that struck me when I heard that, because I have a juvenile record, and one of the things that struck me is that no uh, no juvenile record should be even be mm-hmm. ex- expressed. They, they shouldn't even be talking about it. If he was a juvenile, which they say right in here is being transferred transfer from a youth center, Correct. that information should have never been given out. And whoever gave that information out, uh, and, and, t- and spoke on that, uh, you know, I, I would imagine she'd be in some type of issues with conduct. And so this is where this is this is just more to the situation and story of, you know, no no responsibility being held on their point. So uh, when I <clears throat> excuse me, when I contacted you or when when we had got to first talking, you were expressing how uh, you were talking to the to the captain and, and the chief yeah. about, you know, wanting them to do something, you know, tell me something, do something about this situation. What's been their response? I mean, ultimately when you're, when you're in this, in this point, you know, this isn't, when did this happen? Like three weeks or four weeks ago? March 16th at 1247. 
twelve thirty seven. Uh, so what is their response to you when you're, you know, when you're, when you're having these conversations? I'm, I, I, so the thing is that I'm trying to get to understanding of is this is a double murder that happened in the broad daylight of a sun, a Sunday afternoon. And uh, in, in conversation with Kara, you know, she had kind of expressed that when they said when this information was given to them by the police, it was almost as if, it, you know, the way that, the way that I took what she said was it was almost a, a scenario where they were trying to express to the rest of the community outside of our community. You're not in danger. though. This is just a South Side issue that's right here with these people. Uh, so that's kind of how it always is. Anytime a shooting happens, it's like, oh, but nobody else is in danger. Well, how is it if the killer is still out here in the streets? Correct. You're talking to a certain people that's saying that nobody's in danger because that person still lives in our neighborhoods. We are all in danger if they've just killed somebody and now feel like they have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. So what's their response when you're talking to them about this? Well, their response to me was um, they have a, they needed a shooter. They needed somebody to come forward and say, to be an eyewitness in what we seen them shoot a person. We seen them shoot your grandson. Right. They but need a perfect yeah, scenario. They need a the perfect one. But you get paid uh, 150000 I don't know what it is, but I shouldn't have to uh, bring nobody into your police station. When you say that, what do you mean? Because that's what they ask me. Well, can you get somebody to come in or could you bring them in, you know, and say you. that they seen this? I'm, I'm not getting 160000 a year. To so they're the asking job. you to do their job. Yeah. Go get, job. go get somebody, bring them into us to question. This is the first time I heard this because nope. they were telling Shirley Mitchell the same thing. They were telling someone that they I'm told speaking Sherry to Pruitt right the same thing. And someone I'm talking to now, they told, and they actually did. They brought a witness to them, picked them up, dropped them off, and picked them back up from the police station. And that murder is still unsolved. I, I did the same thing. You know, they picked up the uh, uh, eyewitness. Of the night today wednesday mm -hmm. they picked up an eyewitness that was in the car with my grandson that had warrants out for his arrest we were at the funeral home about 6 30 they picked him up at seven o'clock he was uh, in my front yard this is crazy they had released him you know and then he was an eyewitness with warrants so wow. they didn't keep him yeah they questioned him for about good maybe half an hour then they let him go Wow. I don't understand that. How, you know, there was your eyewitness right there. You know, so. So we had uh, Black Lives Matter Lansing had a parent of some young people come on one of the comment sections. And I'm going to try to find it and bring it in. So I think uh, I want to bring this in so you guys can see it. But she expressed that. Um, do you have it? Mm, I was looking. She had expressed that she had a conversation with. Uh, one of the uh, officers, and actually I think the cold case detective who used to be a community officer who had stated to her, in, you know, in her presence and to her that um, they were just going to let these people weed, weed each other out. I mean, how does that make you, like, how does that make you feel to hear what you believe to be what's, what's happening anyways come from somebody that's unrelated? They don't, they don't know you or this scenario. They were told this at a separate time, separate place, by the very person who's supposed to be investigating these cold case files that, hey, you know, we know all involved, mm -hmm. they'll eventually pick each other off. And that's what I believe. They don't care. They want them to kill each other. So that that's what they have to do. You know, yeah. then they'll be out the streets. But then it's going to be another little boy with an AKA yeah. or a chopper, as they call them. So what are you going to do? They, just, they have shootings every They had three this past weekend. Yeah. You know, teenagers. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So you've been in conversation with some people downtown. You can talk on it or you don't have to. What do you think their uh, response is to all of this? Is it more of a silence type of response? Do they want to silence you, do you believe? Or w what is it? Does it want us to go away? I mean, these there's killers out on the streets right now. I, I think they want me to be quiet because the chief of police made a statement to me Friday when he talked to me. He called me and he said, I know your son. I know your son before this happened. I was like, okay, so what? He's supposed to be dead because you know him before this? Yeah, he had a record, you know, but he's, he shouldn't be in the cemetery right now. Right. You know, if you you guys need to do your job. Yeah. You know who did it. Everybody know who did it. Right. But you're not picking nobody up. Because right. won't nobody come and say, I've seen him with a gun. I've seen him shoot the person. Yeah. They, they, they got more evidence than that. So when you told them you was going to come on the show, I know you had told me that you had conversated with them that you were going to come on the show. What was their response? Okay. That was it. Okay. That seems flippant to me. 
Very. That what they the? know that you're going to come on here and they know that you're going to tell your story and your truth. And they're just like, ah. Do what you got to do. To me, that's very arrogant. Mm -hmm. I know I'm not doing my job. I know that this mother who just lost a grandson is, is upset. And I know that you're going to go on here and air this out. And, you know, whatever. Go for it. And that's kind of the behavior. Like when you've spoken to me about your conversations back and forth with the chief, it's 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 when I tell you it's reminiscent, I wish that I could really like you could be in my mind and understand these other conversations that I've had. He was just in a uh, the police chief and the mayor were both in a conversation with the East Side Neighborhood Association. And uh, one of the one of the uh, people in the association had asked some questions and uh, to Chief Green and of Chief Green. And his response was just like that. It was very aggressive. It was angry. Uh, he came off that way, very, very angry and upset, and just like I can talk to you all how I want to. And these are elected officials, and these are these are officials at any capacity, even if not elected. They should hold a certain amount of respect. I mean, and I think I feel like the conversations you've told me that you've had, you know, with him and the chief, or excuse me, the chief, and uh, and that captain, uh, just isn't upholding that. I mean, it's just the way it's the way to be about yourself. Yeah, I think the chief was a little salty with me Friday when he called me. And because uh, of the, st the statements he was making about, well, I know your grandson. And then it was, he made a statement like, well, you could talk to the mayor. You could talk to the governor if you want. I'm like, I sure can, and I will. That's what and he I said. Say, and, I, and I'm going to talk until I get justice for my grandson. And I promised him that on his when he took his last heartbeat, I was holding his hand. Mm. And I said, we're going to get justice. Mm. And my first thought, I was really angry, and I wanted to just go out and to kill the dog, the cat, the mother, and everybody. But that's not going to help anything. Yeah, the police department need to do their job, not just for my grandson or the young other little boy, but for all the murders that's still out here. Right, we're not going to get any closure. I could be at Kroger's, and the murder could be standing right next to me. Yeah. And, I, and when I look down, I'll be looking, is that the one? I know who did it, mm. you know. Um, do I know what he looked like? No. Mm. You know, when I see a siren, hear a siren now, and I panic because the only thing I think about is my grandson dying, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, it's been really hard for me, you know. Before, I mean, I hear it all the time, and I pray for the people. I pray for the families. But it's in my backyard now. It's in my front yard. Yeah. So now I know what these mothers are going through when they these uh, killers are still out here. Yeah. Killing folks, thinking they John Dillinger mm -hmm. or John Wayne or somebody, mm -hmm. and they done got away with it. Really, they have. Yeah. I think it creates an environment. Um, you know, I, I I just feel like in the city of Lansing as it sits right now. I mean. To have this type of information out is dangerous. And why I say that is, you know, first of all, you know, the younger crowd of people is really, it's, it's a really dangerous environment that they're in right now. But then also to understand that they can really kind of move without having to worry about them really doing an investigation. I mean, that's scary. How does like, that not create an endanger, um, endangering the public? Yeah. And so the aspect of that is that Timothy's got friends, too. And he's got family that care about him, love him, that, you know, feel the same way you do. And maybe they don't take the right road and the right path. And maybe they don't maybe they don't say, I'm going to try to get this justice in court. Maybe they say, I'm going to figure out this justice out here in the streets. They ain't picking nobody up for it anyways. And so the conversation I used to have when I was talking to Chief Green was just that. If you guys don't start doing something about this stuff happening, you're going to have reoccurring, reoccurring, reoccurring. One murder begets the next, begets the next, begets the next. And so that's really, uh, you know, the the point for me is like, how do we not put all of our efforts into the very worst crime there is to be committed? Murder. That's it. How do we not put our efforts into that? I got pulled over the other day for no seatbelt uh, and in texting. The cop pulled up next to me and was like, you know, you put your seatbelt on, yada, yada, pull over here. And I just kept thinking, like, we got 80 some unsolved murders right now. And y'all out here on motorcycles stopping people for seatbelts. Not only is it that. But if you just sit here and look out this window out front, they drag race up and down Cedar Street and MLK all day long. And y'all are pulling people over for this is what I be talking about when I say that they create criminals. When there's a ton of criminals out here that y'all can just go find. Correct. Go catch the criminals. Stop creating criminals by pulling us over trying to find out if we have weed in the car or if we got this in the car. 
go catch the ones that need to be caught right now. And like I said, when we ain't focusing on the most dangerous thing that ever happened to man is murder. What are we focusing on? Like you, you know, you can't tell me you don't have money to solve murders, but you have money to pull people over and catch them for CCW or catch them for, you know, having a bag of weed in the car without a card. Like this is, this is what I'm saying that I think their priorities are not in the right place. And, uh, when it comes down to like the mayor and the city, you know, when you care, like, like we care about the city and you, you, you do tons of work in the community. You know, you talk to us about that when you care from that perspective, you just want things to be good. Like you want people to be okay. So you do whatever it takes for that purpose. And that's that, that scenario, uh, when they take a focus away from that point and it goes into, you know, downtown development and, you know, outdoor drinking areas, that's what they're all focused on now is where can we gentrify and have fun while down here on the South side, we're living in Chicago. We're living in the South side of Chicago. And you have mothers like Judy have to come on here and beg for help Correct. from people that we pay $47 million to do that job. You're right. And about that, uh, the seatbelt thing, my, it's funny because my brother came over this morning and actually they had undercover police standing outside on homes in Washington. That's where I got pulled over. On homes on in that Washington corner. right there. They were undercover in their street clothes just walking so my brother was at the light and the, the guy the police officer hey do your seatbelt work and he's like yeah and no sooner he said that here come the motorcycle car. that's exactly what happened to me <laughs> on the coming. same corner so they've got time and resources for that they got a lot of time and resources to spend their money on seatbelt stings seatbelt stings instead of doing their job do you remember I, when i said i didn't see him yes you literally said i kept saying i, I didn't see him came out of nowhere i always see the police and i did right not see him. this man he came up out of nowhere and i'm like how did you even see me that's it why it's an undercover cop standing that on is, the corner so i wanted go ahead i wanted to back up to something really quick because you talked a little bit about uh your experience specifically with lpd and and then even talking to chief green and as a mother, I just, I want to say that I cannot imagine, imagine going through that with the person that is literally in charge of bringing justice for my child. And I'm so sorry you went through that because we kind of breezed past it a little bit, but I think it's important to come back to the fact that when you made your initial call to Chief Green, the first words out of his mouth were, how, were you, how did you get my phone number? I think that's possibly one of the most disrespectful things I have ever heard um, because he knew who you were. Clearly. And um, even if you wanted to fake it, you know, customer service wise, the first words should always be, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry for what you're going through. Anything. Um, I think that that was disgusting. It was very disrespectful and it was very flippant. And then you talked about, um, you know, the way he said, yeah, I know who your son was before this even happened. And the reason why I wanted to go back to that a little bit is Mike touched on the you know meeting that happened. That was bigger than even that and i want to point out some of the feedback that was given on on chief green from that meeting because what that conversation was surrounding is um both green and propaganda were there uh, at the meeting and the feedback that that i got from from several people that were there was that chief green was noticeably agitated and had no regard for victims that was their words mm -hmm. um there was a question asked about what could LPD do to make victims of domestic violence and sex workers feel more safe when they call the police? Because, you know, Chief Green said, if you defund the police, we'll have more rapes and murders, right? Um, so they asked, you know, domestic violence, sex workers, all of these things, how can they feel more safe uh, when they call the police? Because right now they feel like the police will cause more harm and that they escalate violence and things like that. And uh, he literally, his response was that questions like that irritate him or offend him. Hmm. something like that and then proceeded to gaslight everyone about everything that they do and how great they handle domestic violence calls and was very aggressive in his speech um he said questions like that are disrespectful oh he was sounding like that with, with me as us as well when he, he was talking about he sounded agitated because he said that our his police department was doing a, a great job and why am i you know dog, basically why am i bad mouthing them i'm like because they're not doing their job they know who did this you know they i mean just pick them up you know well my police department is doing this and he was agitated i was actually at work i had to leave out of my office because mm -hmm. i wanted to get loud so i had to leave out and go outside you know because and, and I'm, i was like are you checking me 
because mm-hmm. that's what it sounds like. You, yeah. you, you got a problem. And when, when he said, you could go talk to the mayor, you could talk to the mayor, you could talk to the governor, he was mad. He he, had, he was, he, I wouldn't say mad, agitated, but it agitated. Can I? Can I can I interject in one second? I want I want to I want to say this because uh, I want to I want to drive this home for people. Uh, Chief Green's behavior. I always say this that your your lowest officers, uh, his his um, or her um, behavior is always a uh, reflection of their of their superiors. Right? They're all the way up superior. Meaning that if you have a field officer who does something and stands bravely on it. Like I just beat this kid up and I stand here and I say, I did it. What are you going to do about it? That means that their superior and the superiors above them are condoning that behavior. Meaning when you have a young person or a kid that you tell, don't you ever let anybody disrespect you at school. If they do, you beat them up. When they get into a fight at school, they're not remorseful. They're not crying. They're not saying, please don't call my mom. You know, they're not saying none of that because they know that at home, they already got the permission to do it. So two things about that behavior, that behavior from Chief Green, he has already been condoned uh, in basically hiding a murder inside the jail, meaning that he hit a murder inside the jail along with with, along with uh, with Andy Shore. And that's his boss. There's nobody over top of that. So his behavior with, you know, the Baker Street uh, uh, incident where they, you know, there's 10 police officers that beat up one person on Baker Street. They don't jump on top of a pile like that and throw punches and kicks unless they know they will not be in trouble for it. So when you're talking about the way Chief Green spoke with you, he's been emboldened to act that way, first of all. Secondly, he's he's what people would call, uh, and don't take the term literal, but a dead man walking. And what I mean by that is he's on his way out. He knows it. So I don't care. What are you going to do to me? I'm going to take another job in Phoenix or wherever I decide to go. I can deal with you however I want to. My boss has already condoned the behavior. So you making a complaint about Chief Green's behavior when speaking to you, you'd be completely right about it. But we don't have anybody in management over top of him being the mayor or council who's going to say that's some behavior that's unacceptable. Nobody's going to do anything about it. This is what we're seeing in the city of Lansing. As As it pertains to the murder rate and all of these things going on, there's no accountability across the board from the people who are paid to do that job. And so that's what I would say is that when Chief Green is, is is doing that, you know, it comes from someplace. He's been emboldened to. You know how when you're at a store and, like, you have an issue and you're like, I want to speak to the manager? And they're like, I am the manager? Mm-hmm. When she was talking, I literally had that picture. And it's I an I am the that. manager. It, they, that's how he, it, he he does you, and that's how he's doing other people. And I think it's just so, not just flippant. You, you flip, it is flippant, but it's also disrespectful. Um, it's extremely hurtful, harmful. It's re-traumatizing. And again, I just go back to, you know, no one, and that includes the police, gets to be judge, jury, and executioner. It is not their role, it is not their job to decide who is worthy of an investigation and justice, right? And I think that the way that they're treating you is completely disgusting. It literally, like we told Sherry, I don't, none of, all of those details in that conversation is irrelevant. It is completely irrelevant. We have a justice system, right, that we're supposed to trust, right? That is not anyone's job to decide who gets to do what and whether someone deserved or, or should have died. Th- hmm. That's what I that's what I hear from Chief Green is Sh- I know who he is. Shirley Mitchell said Chief Green will never talk about his police. He will always stand by their side, good or bad. Is that what you kind of taken from that? Yes. So do we all know that Chief Green actually uh, was a part of a lawsuit uh, with LPD back about 12 years ago? I believe it was maybe about 12 years ago. Uh, where there's a there was a similar to what happened just recently with there was like seven or eight lawsuits uh, talking about discrimination. Mm-hmm. Chief Green was actually Within a part of that day. lawsuit. And then he he dropped out of the lawsuit and stated that he wanted to try to work on the issues that he knew they had there from within. And so then he rose the ranks to a chief and now is a part of that political game and click, as they call it, uh, where this type of thing doesn't matter you would expect a black man because this is what the the media thinks like oh there's a black man in there he should care right he should do the right thing but the actions speak differently uh so i want to bring this in real quick um have you spoken to uh to uh councilman hussein no where where does your which side of town do you stay on personally I'm south side i live okay. literally one minute from where my grandson got killed so, that's third so your 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 council member is this person right here who uh said this over the weekend 
He said, first of all, or excuse me, for all of you uh, who are raising kids in areas where constant gunfire is normalcy, I apologize. You and they don't deserve that. I've been trying to contact the mayor and chief throughout the bullshit tonight. It was, he was talking about a shootout that happened in Logan Square over the weekend, like he was just talking about. Uh, I've been trying to contact the mayor and chief throughout the bullshit tonight. Have tried to get them to understand what it's like to have your children, age nine or younger, hear the constant gunfire and wonder if they're next. It's difficult to simulate from Moore's River Drive, Andy Shore, and DeWitt Township, Chief Green. However, that's what we're dealing with. I apologize, Lansing. Come morning, come morning, it's about to get real for some of these bureaucrats. He posted this and then the comment section blew up, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody was in there congratulating him on speaking up. And I, I, I was happy he spoke up too finally because I can't keep saying, hey, you guys need to be looking at this. And then when they do, I, I beat them down for now you, now you care. But what was really surprising to me is that about an hour later, he removed it. He had put in, uh, and I think I got this actually. He had put in the, um, uh, I don't know if I, I don't think I could screenshot it. He had put into that post, uh, some screenshots of his text messages back and forth with the mayor, Chief Green, and I guess the person who owns the building that that, that, that happened in. And um, it was kind of the same environment. It was kind of like, you know, what do you expect us to do? You know, like that type of thing. And this is this is a council member, you know, finally speaking spitting up fire. on this and spitting fire. I mean, that was that was fire that he was spitting and he was almost threatening. Uh, and he even actually did threaten in one of his um in one of his text messages back and forth with them that he was going to bring this environment out to their neighborhood and see how they liked it. So, I mean, I thought that was, I mean, I thought that was him stepping out, but then when he erased it, you know, that's where I was like, wait a minute, like what's going on? It's bigger than this. And so what I'm saying, why I'm saying this is I talk to a lot of these council members and I talk to people who uh, are in positions to want to try to do something, but they always get kind of silenced by somebody, something in a bigger, in a bigger way. You have a little experience with that. And I don't want to talk about this person if you're not willing to. I would just say that there is somebody that's up there that has been conversating with you uh, who's kind of been like the field agent to silence you. Uh, and, I, you know, you can speak on it if you want to. I don't I'll speak on it after you leave, but I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, but there's been a field agent who uh, when we talk about this type of behavior with 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 um with him taking that post down, he obviously got a phone call from somebody that said, you need to take that down. Mm -hmm. He's speaking straight from the heart. He's telling them exactly how he feels. He lives in our ward. He lives right off uh, Pleasant Grove behind there, behind Vons. You know, he, he lives in the neighborhood. So he hears it. He knows it's going on. He's from the neighborhood. He grew up in the same house. I believe that he lives in or in the same neighborhood. But when he decides to speak up from his position where he's actually has a chance to do something or, or you know, he's get people to gather around, the agent comes. Mm -hmm. Not to say it's the same agent that's, that's been at but you, a. but it's an agent. So how are we going to ever stop this type of thing when you have people who decide they want to speak out? Say, for instance, for me, uh, I've been speaking out on these things for, you know, a couple years now, very openly. Uh, for three or four years, um, two years, I was kind of silent, dormant, trying to work the system on the inside. Then finally, I was like, all right, I can't get nothing done from here. I got to go out and go public. So this violence I've been talking about for at least two years now, like constantly. But the field agents came to me and then I went against and I said, I'm not going to be silent. And I kept going. They're going to come to you. You've been already hit with one. You'll mm -hmm. be hit with more. I think you said something about having a meeting uh, Wednesday. This is why we wanted to kind of press the issue today uh, to get this story out. Do you want to talk on that? No. OK, uh, we'll talk about it at another later date after you have that Debrief. meeting. Yeah, for sure. Right. So uh, but these field agents are going to come. As you speak mm -hmm. to get justice for your family, they're going to come. They're going to say, you know, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't say that. You shouldn't go on America 20 Life because, you know, Mike just wants to use you. They're going to say these type of things. So be be cognizant of that. But also, I always I always and I know you know this. You you born West Side. You get it. I, I think that I always want to ask somebody when they come to me with a story like that about somebody or when the field agent comes, I always like, what is your intentions? These are people dying in the streets. What are your intentions to silence it? What is your reasoning behind it, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the, that, that's kind of the confusing portion for me. And so given the fact that we're not going to talk on that that individual who is your uh, field agent, mm -hmm. we all got one. Um, you know, I guess that same environment is what 
we try to do in the in the village as far as these murders go. And when we talked about uh, the the young men that got murdered, your your grandson, and um, the ones who were involved, you know, the kid that was in the back seat, I told you I know him very well, coached him in football, uh, you know, just had a run in with him, not run in with him, but a situation similar to this uh, a year ago where somebody had gotten shot and uh, he was implicated in it and I conversated with him. Um, and then you have the people who are accused of doing it or the people that we all kind of know. Uh, I know them as well. And so this is an environment that, you know, when I talk about what we do at the villages, we want to get to them before that happens. But I'm their field agent. I want to go catch them before something like this happens. I had that conversation. Uh, so that's kind of where I move, uh, you know, in, in my world and best I can. Um, so going forward is has Sherry reached out to you? I know she said in the comments that she would like to get in touch with you. Uh, no, that's what she was kind of asking us to, oh, okay. you know, give her her number just because that's mm -hmm. kind of what we want to do is build a support system and a network and create that because it's hard navigating this, mm -hmm. it's, especially if you're being treated the way that you're being treated right now. Yeah. It's, no, no one has. But the chief, you know, he called me because I called him and a few other people called me, but I, I'm, it's, I want to get justice for everybody. At this point, it's like I got an elephant sitting on my chest. Yeah, you know, and, and it's it's hard for me to breathe. So I could imagine how the other mothers and fathers feel. You know, that's been uh, dealing with this for years, and they quote, uh, "We need somebody to tell who it is." So if that's the case, you give me the hundred and whatever you make a year. Right. Okay. Or to give the other parents. Mm -hmm. But we need closure. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got these guns. Where is these 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds getting these AKAs from? Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, what what are you going to do? It was, it was three shootings this past weekend. Right. You know, are you doing anything about it? Mm -hmm. No, they're not doing nothing about it. Nothing. No, you know the kids can't even go to a little a birthday party. That was a little birthday party they had in the Logan Center, mm. you know, mm. and they were there shooting in the little kids' birthday party. Two no, people. yeah, it happened at the Zap Zone out on the West yeah. Side. Yeah, two I mean, people did. Yeah. Two people got shot in the park this past weekend. You yeah. know, twenty-three year old girl and a twenty year old, twenty two year old guy. Then a fourteen year old girl got shot in the lake. I think was yesterday. Yeah, they're not doing anything because they're all black. Yeah, you know, if it was like I told Chief Green, if it was in Hazlitt, he probably would have done something. By somebody would have been in jail. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I want to uh, go ahead, Erica, for a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull this up so I can read it to her. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about, or, or just even ask you, is just kind of you have you know something coming up where you feel like hopefully you can kind of put this out on the table and get some traction. What do you, what do you hope to come out of this aside? You want justice, but what is it that, you know, the police can, can do, you know, better for you specifically up to this point, it's been bad. I mean, there, I, they've, there's been nothing good. I've heard about how they've handled you. I don't think I don't, at this point, I don't know. I just, I just want justice for my grandson and just for the other little boy. I want the police to do their job. If you get, if you're not doing your job, right, bring somebody else in, bring another agency in. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. because at this point, that's what it looks like you need to do. Bring another agency in because you guys can't do your job. You know, the detectives that you got, I don't know what, I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand yeah. either. And you bring up a really good point because there's no other agency, company, business that I can think of that um, isn't audited in a way to understand where the money is going, how it's being spent, where it goes. We're just told we need more. We need massive amounts and we need more and you can't take any of it away. But we're not going to audit. We're not going to screen. We're not going to question how it's spent, where it's spent. And you talk, all, even Sherry talked about that, you know, where it's being spent. If you're not doing your job well, in what company do you not do your job well and still get to remain in that position? There's no recourse at this point for any of this. And we're expected to just take everything at face value and at the very 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 least knowing how the public is feeling right now i think that the head of that that department which right now is chief green could at the very least make people feel better about their situation and treat them like human beings at, at the very least i want to bring in something real quick that was sent to me um so have you have you heard about advanced peace at all no it's an initiative that was brought in by the ingham county health department after they had uh, declared racism a public health crisis and 
being a part of that aspect was the violence that was going on in the city. And so they wanted to attack the gun violence in some sort of way. And it was being led by uh, Jessica Yorko, who was an ex-council member who now works for them. And uh, and she's been bringing together, um, matter of fact, the first meeting they had uh, to discuss Advance Peace, which is a national effort. And it's been very, it's been proven to stop gun violence within the cities uh, that it's been working in, which is Richmond, California, I believe Sacramento. Now they have one in Brooklyn, I believe. Uh, and all over the all over the country, and it, and it's the statistics that have come out of the shootings that have been able to be stopped is crazy, it's astronomical. I mean, just within the first year of it working, mm-hmm. Jessica Yorko sent a proposal to the city of Lansing to get funding for this program, and this was the response from the mayor: "Our dear Miss Jer- just Miss Yorko, thank you for your email and sample letters. I am certainly supportive of the concept of reducing gun violence through intervention and interruption practices." I'm also impressed with the Advanced Peace Peacemaker mm-hmm. Fellowship Initiative and appreciate your advocacy on their behalf. Due to the impacts of COVID-19 on the budget of the City of Lansing, the City of Lansing could be looking at significantly reduced revenues for the 2021-22 fiscal year, which begins in July. One, many of our employees have taken zero pay increases. Our legacy costs have increased to over $40 million per year in a declining $130 million budget. Our reserves are very low, and there could be even more cuts to city services as a result of the economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. Lansing had to cut its budget by $12.5 million over three months last year, and there could be significant revenue reduce or reductions this year as well without watching expense reductions. As a former council member, you recall the decisions that had to be made during the Great Recession, including layoff of police and firefighters. The current economic conditions are worse than the Great Recession, and Lansing could be looking at tough decisions. Even with these cuts, there are many requests and needs. We would like to add more social workers to complement our policing efforts. We need to replace aging equipment. We need to fix our city infrastructure. We have costs to ensure equity and racial justice in our city. We have to build back our reserves to minimum 12% of the budget, which he screwed up, and many other things. We also have many requests in the contract with the City of Lansing for their important programs. As you know, I will introduce my budget uh, to council on the 22nd of March as determined by the Lansing City Charter. Until that time, I will continue to review the revenues and expenditures expected for the city of Lansing in the current and next fiscal year. Many factors are still outstanding and will have tremendous impact on a proposed budget. Most important among these is the status of President Biden's COVID relief legislation, which I continue to advocate for strongly at the national level. Why I'm supportive of the advanced peace concept The decision on whether or not to include a new $240,000 expense for the city of Lansing will depend on the economic viability of the city of Lansing to afford this large new expense as compared to the many competing priorities that need funding with potentially reduced revenues. Competing. I want to read that part again. While I am supportive of the advanced peace concept, which we know across the nation has been known to stop violent crime and guns and so on. Um, the decision on whether or not to include a new $240,000 expense for the city of Lansing will depend on the economic viability of the city of Lansing to afford this large new expense as compared to many competing priorities that need funding with potentially reduced revenues, meaning that they may want to build a shuffleboard downtown and their budget's less than that advanced piece. So I may want to budget that and not this. We might not like our new uniforms and need different ones next year. Yeah. Competing priorities. What could compete with? We will continue to this? review the expense and revenue numbers for the city and will present the administration budget to the Lansing City Council on March 22nd. The city council then has until March 24th to pa- or May 24th to pass a budget that will take effect on July 1st. Thank you for your time and advocacy on behalf of Advanced Peace. We can continue to discuss this as the budget situation evolves. This was sent on Where's the date? March 1st. And your, are you gonna your grandson was killed when? May 16th. A week before his birthday, he would have been 24 years old. So what the mayor said in that, and now he's touting this, and even uh, Lansing State Journal has um, mentioned that, you know, the mayor has been supportive of this advanced peace thing, and he's doing this big thing to stop gun violence, and they just maybe not know about this. But he's then not. in response to that, many, many others, uh, council members, Kathy Dunbar, one included, came back with a response that was like, how is this not the priority right now? We have young men dying in the streets, particularly the black and brown community, every single day. How is this not this as important as anything else that you're talking about right now? How is this not the priority? Um, 
two hundred fifty thousand dollars is what it, what their what their portion would have been. The Ingham County Department uh, Public, the Ingham County Health Department had already put in their portion, and they were garnering money from other places. Um, they spent two hundred fifty thousand dollars, as you heard me say earlier, on uniforms. Mm-hmm. How is this not a priority? I think it's just like when we talk about racism being a public health crisis. It's because we have to bring awareness to it. Black Lives Matter. We have to tell you that. Like we have to tell y'all that our lives matter. Well, in this case, the scenario and what's going on with these murders in the city, they don't matter because if this was white kids being killed at this alarming number, no matter what their background was, this would not have been a question. $250,000 to save a life, even just one, Mm -hmm. even just one life. There's no other priority that should be more involved in that. So I say that to say it's taken now, I think, last, it's been a year since we've been trying to work on advanced peace. And Jessica Yurko has been championing this really hard. Ingham County Health Department has been pressing it really hard. They just got the buy-in from the city because, of course, we're in a mayoral election. It looks good to say, hey, I'm doing I was something. I going to ask you were going to talk about, about the steps that led up to the actual support. And I think that's important in the timing. Yeah, I mean, it was. we know why it was. Yeah. It's election season. Yeah. There was no conversation. There was nothing. There was no support. That was where it got left. And then all of a sudden comes out and says, oh, it was a surprise to everyone at the city council meeting. He comes on and, oh, we're going to include it in the bu- budget presentation. And then the next time you hear about it, it's, oh, Mayor Andy Shore is wanting to do this, you know, violence prevention effort. And and it's just, again, another disgusting display of the propaganda type things without actually trying to prioritize what's actually happening and fix the issue. I think that's important to really name that this is the priority. And Kathy Dunbar was very correct in the response and even speaking on it on council saying like what other priority is there right now besides this that's going on i'm gonna they, read her response that would be, kathy yeah. dunbar's response was good afternoon mayor i think we're all painfully aware of the city's economic situation yes we need to make tough choices about where we spend uh, scarce uh, resources and those decisions should be driven by necessity and highest return on investment Lansing has a problem with gun violence. That cannot be disputed. Studies show gun violence correlates to social economic conditions, which means the economic downturn you cited will result in a higher rate of gun violence. Gun violence is already costing the city, starting with the lives lost and families forever changed. Add to that the cost of law enforcement. Law enforcement at the time of the incident, subsequent investigations and court costs, jail, prison costs, immediate treatment costs, long-term physical and mental care, a cost, lost wages, and the cost of violent crime on future residential and commercial investments in our city. We have an opportunity to invest in a program that has proven to reduce gun violence and build community. The return on that investment is lives, families, and money saved. Gun violence will not be reduced by intangibly supporting the concept. I ask that you consider the high cost of gun violence when creating your budget and include funding for the Advanced Peace Initiative. So that was sent directly after that. So so I I just look at it from my perspective. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that we're doing that right now. So the next mother that we have to have come in here and have this conversation with, I feel like since we've been making this noise, them people, the people downtown who are absolutely doing nothing with the money that we give them, we give them to stop this are responsible for it. They should all be on trial as well, in my opinion. So I'll end with that. I agree. 100%. Um, So let me see if we got any uh, questions in here. I think somebody had one. Um, I just know there's been a lot of support support for you you. uh, right in the beginning. I mean, there's everybody was just pouring out support. People were in tears listening to your story. And I will definitely, both Miranda and Sherry, want to get with you, and I'll make sure that that happens. this, this This is bigger than anything that I ever dealt with. And I'm a pretty strong person. Oh, I know. This is hard. My grandson shouldn't be at the cemetery. And I do think I'm mad at the Lancy State Journal because what they were saying was like, he deserved it. That's to me and to the community, what they wrote in there was like, well, he got what he deserved. <clears throat> no one has came to my house or called me from the city of Lancy or the State Journal and said, what can I do to help him? I'm so yeah. sorry. No one. You know, I, I cry myself to sleep at night. I sit in the cemetery. I just don't understand. I just, I got a lot of questions. That I just don't understand. I don't understand why the police not doing their job. I don't understand why they won't pick somebody up. 
just if it's for the 72 hours, which I know they can to question somebody and say, well, we we picked him up and, or something. Mm-hmm. And I'm just waiting on the call to say, well, we got him. But I don't think I'm going to get that call. There's pressure that can be applied. There is. You know, I don't know how much pressure we can actually apply on people who just don't care. Oh, I met the police on people involved. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's what I meant. Oh, like, for sure. Uh, we sh- none of us. We are community members. You are a mother. You are a victim of a crime. None of us should have to be doing this. No. Uh, and I'm just concerned, you know, through conversation that I've had with, with mothers, you know, every, every, you know, everybody has family and friends and so on and so forth. And this thing just carries on. Uh, you had talked about, um, you know, everything that you've done in the community and the place that you've been and where, you know, like the things that you've done. And uh, I feel like, you know, I, I guess I just feel like, you know, what you talked about with Lansing State Journal and we talked about, you know, when we had that conversation with uh, the person who wrote that, uh, you know, she admitted that, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't have, you know, taken that stance and we shouldn't have went that direction. But it came from somewhere. Yeah. That's not information that they knew. No. And that's the bigger issue for me. Because if the police are telling people that in that flippant, again, that flippant way that, hey, you know, this kid had this, or I knew this kid, he was a, he was a this, or he was a that. Uh, you know, I'm not concerned about so much about what they're writing as much as I am about how they're doing dealing with the investigation. And when they show up on a scene, like you said, and they see, you know, oh, who is that? Is that Timothy? Yeah, it is. Oh. She stepped back. She, yeah. She she didn't respond. She was the first one on, on the scene. Shirley Michener, whose son Brandon was killed, had a very similar a situation where it matters how something is categorized right when it happens. Mm-hmm. Meaning that if they come to something and they categorize it as a suicide, a lot of times they investigate it from that standpoint or don't investigate it. They say, oh, it was a suicide or it was a murder-suicide and they don't investigate it, right? So they don't look into all the clues because the, all the clues they're going to get in and the leads are going to get are going to come out like the first 24 or 48 hours. That's when people are going to be so ready to talk. That's when you need to find the witnesses and all of that stuff. And so when you don't categorize it as what it is and then your investigation in the beginning stages goes that way, then you lose a lot of time and a lot of a lot of. Uh, and so I wanted to talk about that because you said that at the house where it happened at, they had allowed people they allowed them to move their stuff out. It was yellow taped, and they. It was yellow tape. The, the tape was around there. When I got there, I I went through the tape, and they stopped me. Like I'm like, and I heard one of the police officers say, "That's the grandmother," you know, mm-hmm. and so they told me where he was at. But the tape was around, but they still allowed them to move. And when you say them, the, the police allowed them to move in and out the house, you know. So. So anything can be coming in and out the house. Who knows? Anything. Anything. You guys did a balloon release after that, and then you was telling me about, you know, what happened, what happened in that situation. We did a balloon release on a Monday. Um, instead of them doing their job to find the murderers of my son, they sent th- uh, three cars out to tell us that we were parked the wrong way, you know, at the balloon release. And we parked on a uh, public street, but we parked the wrong way, and neighbors have been called, you know, because of it's, it's noise. Mm. Okay, well, we saying goodbye to my son. Yeah, he's my grandson, but he's my son. Yeah, he's been with me since he was a month old. Yeah, you know, so that's you know that's he's my son. Yeah, I just absolutely. didn't have birth, but he's been with me since he was a month old. So, you know, is you, you can you can uh, send police out about that. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then the night of the uh, the viewing, they came to my house. They sent two police officers over there that night. Well, we got a call from the neighbors. I'm like, well, we're saying goodbye to my grandson, my son. So now they're just, they're on you now. That's just. It's like, it's borderline harassment. So Timothy was shot before. Did they find the people who did that? No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They didn't even look anymore. No. He got shot. He was paralyzed when he got shot. When he got shot this time, he was paralyzed. Mm. Did they find the people that did it? No. And so you talked about, I want to touch on something else because they talked about it also in the, in the LSJ article about him getting caught with a firearm. And you had explained to me why he was ha- why he had that firearm. And it's exactly the reason why I do 2A21, my program to license people for firearms. Uh, you were talking about how he was in his wheelchair and he was rolling down the street and somebody seen. So can you tell us a little bit about that? He was in his wheelchair. He was paranoid. 
and he, he, I mean, it came as doctors said he was paranoid. He was scared. They hadn't found no shooters. Yeah. So yeah, he had a gun to protect himself. Yeah. You know, well, what he could do. You know, being paralyzed. Right. You know, so that's why he had the gun. It was the first officer to be that was on the scene. Then was the was first officer, the lady officer that was on the scene when he got killed. Wow. The one that stepped back. You know, so wow. she knew exactly who it was because it's the same lady. You know, From when so, he got shot and got paralyzed. Cr- no, when he when they stopped him oh, with for the, gun the gun in the wheelchair. Yeah. You know, so you know, he had to go to therapy. I mean, you know, who wouldn't? He's twenty one years old. He got shot. Yeah. You know, he's paralyzed. Absolutely. You know, they taunted him on, on Facebook, you know, you're rolling now. You know, they just they tortured him on you know, mentally, you know. No, that's a um so I did want to touch on that because I thought it was a good perspective for LSJ to understand something because when they posted it in here, it sounded very negative. It sounded like, you know, he's already been having a gun. When you live in the environment that we live in, even if you're not directly involved and not to say anybody is or isn't, but even if you're not, you can't be out here bare. And especially if you've already been shot once. Correct. If I've been shot, I don't care if I can or can't have a firearm. Uh, it's something that we talk about in the firearms world all the time is that people aren't scared of guns a lot of the time because most people haven't been shot. They don't know what it feels like. So it's like with a, with a hot stove. You don't put your hand on a hot stove because most people have burnt themselves at some point in time in their life so they know what fire feels like. Well, when somebody who has been shot knows what it feels like to be shot and then your son who had been paralyzed, that puts something in your mind. So when we talk about equity, as far as it's concerning um, you know, the community, you have to take that into consideration when when we're charging people with CCW and so on and so forth. What is the environment they live in that they think that they need to have a firearm? And somebody like your son, who you know has already been shot once to a point where now he's you know uh, paralyzed for the rest of his life, he's not gonna go nowhere without a firearm. That's just plain. I wouldn't either. I don't. You don't. You still haven't caught the shooter. That shooter could still be trying to come finish the job. I mean, there's a lot of context that's very, that's lost with, I just, you know, I, I can, only way I can say it is that people who don't understand the environment that, that these young people are living in. Mm-hmm. So I had a, a young person in here today uh, who was talking to one of the other reporters about a story they're doing about the violence that's going on in the city, and these young people are terrified. And so they run in to get guns, and then they're getting the guns and they're not licensing themselves properly. Next thing you know, they're going to get caught with a CCW because they're going to carry it because they're paranoid to death. Now, that's just the normal paranoia of what's going on. But give it to somebody who's been shot once already. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. So I feel like the context of that needed to be stated because all of the stuff that was put in this, uh, whether true or not, there's context behind it. Uh, There's context that needs to be heard. Uh, And that was one of them. That When you told me that story about the CCW that he got caught with, why, uh, you know, when when it happened and i was just like that makes sense to me yeah. to us it makes sense mm-hmm. we get it like you got shot you're paralyzed and the shooter's still out here i'm carrying a gun everywhere i go even if it ends me up in prison because i'd rather be in there than he had been one you know a, a, a couple inches higher and hit me in my heart mm-hmm. and then i'm dead you know so it's trauma that's the context and trauma i can't even express i've been on gunshot wounds i've been on people who've been shot and um you know i've seen it firsthand you know, even back when I was younger, I've seen it, you know, and so I get it. It's the most traumatic thing anybody can ever go through, and it changes people. It changed my whole family. It changed me, you know, because he lived, he stayed with me. So I had yeah. to change my whole house around, my you know, for him, Yeah. you know, because he make it handicap accessible. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was a lot of trauma on both of us, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Not just, you know, just the family, period. So we it did to this to happen. Yeah. And they could put it in the state journal how somebody gave it to them instead of asking questions. Yeah, I agree. And there's layers to it, because I think that a lot very often we hear the term trauma response um, in white communities, but we don't hear it often in the black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. But trauma response is a real thing and everybody's trauma looks different and and how you respond to it, what you choose to do, how you choose to deal with it, because we have to remember it hadn't been that long he and you all were still dealing with the effects of that first act of violence. Correct. And so that's the mindset he's in. So it's um, not lost how important the role, the very, very crucial role that both the police and the mainstream media play 
into situations like this. And it can't be understated. When the police make their initial statements, when they're discussing this, when they respond to you, when they're talking to the media, I cannot begin to say how important it is that they are not biased in that way because that sets a precedent to Mike's point. He talked about that. And then when the media reports on it and they make the conversation surrounding listing a person's prior transgressions, their history, their rap sheet, it's all irrelevant. You can't do that because guess what it does? It excuses the lack of uh, justice being brought by the police because when the media has already told the public, this person probably deserved it. They, they, they had stop it coming. Caring. Everyone stops caring and it gives the police a green light to not do their damn job. Exactly. And that's just unacceptable. It's everyone's responsibility. I wanted to, I wanted to bring this on the screen because this is what was put on uh, BLM's uh, Facebook page and was pulled off. And we uh, we had the description, obviously, of the person who stated it. But uh, I was told by a detective, a detective last year that she's going to let our young men go tit for tat in the street. She said these cases will remain cold cases to my face said since she was the community resource officer for years, she actually knows many of the city's young people personally. So we're not just making this up. Uh, this person who I know actually, um, you know, to have, to be able to come on here and say that she was told specifically by an officer who was a, you know, a community resource officer that they're gonna let them just go. Let's just let them have war in the streets. They'll, they'll figure each other out. But we're we're witnessing those actions right now. This is not like we're just, hey, you guys don't care. We're witnessing it. You know, you're you're one of two mothers in this incident who lost somebody. There's multiple other instances. There's a 14 year old that was killed on the east side, 15 year old that was killed, uh, a 19 year old that was killed on. I believe it was Malcolm X or, uh, you know, a couple months ago that nobody has any word of what happened with all of these kids. These are kids being killed. That's my concern. Anybody 25 and under, in my opinion, is a kid. And so you got all of these black kids and brown, because a couple of the kids were Hispanic, mm -hmm. black and brown kids being killed. And the mayor says, I've got to figure out if I can work that into my budget. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about the, the highest of authority giving permission for them not to investigate not to care, not to do anything about these things with the $47 million budget. That they already have. That they already have. That they already have. Let's audit that. Let's audit that. Let's see your impact. Nonprofits have to show impact when we write grants, right? Yep. We've yeah. got to show impact. We have to, we have to, you know how that yeah. goes. You have to create a budget. You have to prove your budget. You've got to prove it. You've got to prove the impact after that to get the money, all these different things. Um, one thing I wanted to say um, about that is I get all the time that I just don't that people say to me, you just don't like Andy Shore. You just don't like Chief Green. That's not true. What I do think, though, is that if I was their manager, I would be writing uh, pips like performance enhancement protocol uh, because they're just bad at their job. That's really it. When the police department sucks this bad, beating people, killing people, not investigating murders with a forty seven million dollar budget, that means the person that's the CEO of it sucks. Mm -hmm. Meaning that if IBM was to run that bad, which they did because they ended up falling, but Apple, if Apple was to run that bad, then all of a sudden all their stuff started breaking down and people were, you know, they were having all these complaints from their customer service, they would get a new CEO. They wouldn't start trying to find the manager from the store. They would say, there's got to be somebody up top that's not holding the people down there accountable. And they would, they would remove that person and get them out. So I was a fan of Chief Green when he first came in. I tried to help him. I tried to figure out a way to bridge the gap between the community because we know that when the community is at odds with the police, we suffer by this way. How many, think about how many ways the police can hurt us. They can physically beat us. They cannot investigate the murders of our mm. children. They can do all types of things. So if we have a bad scenario or situation with them, they can just mule up on us and not do anything in our neighborhoods or fix anything or help. So I always tried to help that process along so that we didn't have to have those issues. Um, but then I come to find out, you just ain't good at this. It don't matter how much I help you, you're not going to be good at it. Uh, you know, budgetarily, that's what the chief of police does. He figures the budget. What do we need money for? Where do we need money to go? He has to spend up their budget every year. And that's how you got $250,000 in uniforms because he had this money left over. And he was like, what do I do with it? Oh, we can get new uniforms. Or they'll say we can get new guns or we'll spend more money on ammunition. We'll stockpile, you know, this or that or this or that. And when I'm telling you all this for, they have the money they need. They have what they need to investigate. They're just not caring about it. So we need a new CEO. 
Mm-hmm. And then there's a CEO over top of that CEO that's supposed to be holding him and every other department accountable, and mm-hmm. they don't. So that's the top two people in that chain that we're concerned with when it comes to the gun violence, and they're not doing anything about it. Exactly. That's what we don't like. So it could be Jill Schmo in that yeah. position. It is that position. Your I position yeah. holds weight, power. You hold the purse strings, all of these things. So I couldn't care less who you are. That It's that position, and that is what you took on when you took that position. Um, I think Heather must have come on here and said something. Yeah, there's so much. Very true. Ash said, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn are the simplifications of trauma responses. Very true. And so if your uh, trauma response is fight, oh, this is a very a good comment. Response. Heather Nicole says, I'm trying to go off track. I'm not trying to go off track. But could we also look at the fact that none of these young black men seem to be surviving? Every single murder that that you read about says victim died shortly after arriving to the hospital. Mm. People survive gunshot wounds. It makes you wonder if these young black men are just low on the priority list because they're thought to be thugs or gang members. I I have to speak on that, and I'm glad that they said that. I don't believe so. Uh, and, And the reason I say that is because I've been in the hospital room. I've been in the ambulance with these with these uh with victims of gunshots and i've never seen that type of behavior i'll just be honest with you i've never seen the behavior where they're not doing their job because of a certain scenario but i'm just that's my own opinion of my and you know i'm very critical so i would absolutely state that uh but um i can tell you that one thing that really affects the survivability of a gunshot wound is that it takes us longer to get to it and what i say by that is like i teach um, stop the bleed in my CPL classes because a lot of times these young people will be next to their friend if they get shot and maybe they hit an arterial you know, vein or something and they're, and they're oozing blood from a femoral artery. If they know how to stop that bleed and give us time to get there and safely transport them, then they have a better chance of living. Uh, so that's, a, that's a one scenario that may affect this uh, gunshot wounds and people dying from them uh, because it takes us a long time to get there, as the ambulance does. Because the police have to get there, they have to secure the scene, and they allow us to come in, which takes minutes. You know, it may take 10, 15 minutes to clear, and that person's just laying there during that time. So that's just, it's just a lot involved with that. But um, I can't say that that's true, but that's definitely a good uh, a good question mm-hmm. to ask and try to figure out. It's a valid question. You know, where were these people shot at? And I don't want to, I don't necessarily need to know that with your son, but. You know, where were these people shot? And if they were shot in, you know, again, a, a position or a situation in their body that they should have probably survived from but weren't getting the priority treatment. But, again, I've rolled people in with gunshot wounds. They go right to the trauma and they get right at them. So that's just my experience. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see this because it's a response um, to someone saying, like, so uniforms are more important than my son's life. And Shirley came in and said – I think they can't or don't want to solve our children's lives, so they spend money elsewhere. I pray that this doesn't ever happen to their children or anyone close to them because they would do a thorough investigation. Yeah. That sentiment is just shared amongst so many. Well, yeah, we know that's a fact. Um, And matter of fact, while we're talking about that, um, I'm going to bring a video in. Uh, So when I spoke to counsel about this, and I kind of want to let you guys all hear this because... This was before your son was killed as well, Mm -hmm. uh, that I went on council and stated this and nobody had anything to say. Rob came in, Judy, and said, love and peace, mother. May God send you the necessary answers and peace of mind. Tamara says, I just want to reach out and hug her. Thank you. So um, let me get this video in here real quick. Is there anything else that, Judy, that you wanted to touch on before we uh, close up here? Uh, anything of significance that you can remember or anything that's happened particularly that you wanted to talk about? I did want to say they had a gun uh, shootout about maybe like a couple of days after my son got killed Mm -hmm. on West Saginaw. And the police made a statement was, this is retaliation from the two guys that got killed on the south side. Really? Yes. How would they know that? How I don't know, but it was a statement made by police this retaliation from the two guys that got killed on the south side and and uh i can't make this stuff up so and yeah. it's happening you know it's happening every day you know people are ducking every you can't even go to the store if you go to you're scared you go to the store right unless you live in oakmont 
Yeah. Or half it. Mm-hmm. But if I go to Kroger's on MLK, I got to worry about if I'm going to get shot. That's a fact. You know, if I go to the gas station at the marathon, I got to worry if I'm going to get shot. Mm. Uh, this will be, this will be uh, very, very true. This will be valid. very, very valid to what I'm about to put in here now. If I can put it in here, let me see. What am I looking at right here? Oh, this is a preview. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm trying to figure this new new little, setup. Yeah, new setup we got here. Nope, that's not it. Sorry, y'all. One second. That should work. No. Oh, it was so timely. <laughs> I hope you should try no, to get it in there. I'm going to. And it was public comment. This was um, at city council. And, and this was not <laughs> like the first time or even the last time. But a lot of us, when we go on council, um, pretty much every meeting, I, I feel like Mike has begged, pleaded, urged, you name it, um, council, mayor's administration, LPD, anyone, everyone to, to just care, care more about what's going on in the city and the violence that's going on. And it's really difficult when it keeps happening and you keep thinking that if this was a priority, would we be preventing mothers from having to go through this if there was more priority put on our communities? Because hey, if it thanks wasn't a lot. another... I'm going to play it. I got it, actually. Got it? Yes. Yeah, I got it, actually. Perfect. I'm going to have to play it. You're not going to hear it. You're not going to see it, but you'll hear it. So let me turn this off. It's just a oh, Zoom visually anyways. first of all i'm pretty i'm positive chief green wrote linda appen's statement about how dangerous this is going to be if repealed these laws and ordinances that aren't being used right now uh it sounds ridiculous first of all this is an open carry state state law uh says that you know i don't understand why the city would be trying to impede on people's two a uh privileges anyways so that's not an issue no more people are going to die because this law doesn't get repealed the law is already in place uh, so I, I just, it just makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, mayor can't wait to see you out in the neighborhoods. You are a hard person to find. Hopefully you, uh, you post that schedule. Uh, we'll meet you out there to pick up trash outside of that, this police budget, uh, which I believe is in the fiscal year budget. We still don't have anything defunding police and, and stopping these crimes. In the last week, we lost a 16 year old and a 19 year old, uh, to, to homicide. Uh, we know there's an issue out here. Uh, again, there's nothing in place. We're begging and pleading for city money to put towards advanced peace. Uh, when we have actual play- people here that are doing this work, I'm not against advanced peace, but I think that we can't put all of our eggs in a basket here. We've got to start thinking outside the box. Uh, none of that's happening. We got uh, you know 40 some million dollars going to the police department uh, to clean up crimes. And you know, the only thing that I can think is as sad as this is, when this crime starts knocking on your door, you don't come begging to Mike Lynn to figure it out for you. Not to say you would, but most likely I'll know the person who was at your door. Most likely I'll know the people that are doing this shooting. So what I'm saying by that is because it's not at your door, cleaning the streets of trash and using police to do that is more important than cleaning up the guns and stopping this violence and putting money back into community organizations so that we can get these kids to stop doing this type of thing. So until you guys start focusing on that, this crime is only gonna creep back into your areas, back into your neighborhoods, until eventually it's one of your children. And Andy Shore, you should be really, you should be really concerned with this given the fact that both of your kids go to, go to Ever High School. You should be really concerned that the kids that I keep telling you about that we need money to stop from doing bad things are gonna be in the same classroom with your children. Walking out of school, the shore name is not all that represented in Lansing in, in a good way. I would be concerned about those type of things. So that's the concern that we should have with this city budget is stopping this type of crime so it doesn't end up at your door. Like none of us want it to be at your door or anybody else's door. But every morning I got to wake up and hear about another kid in the neighborhood who's been killed by gun violence because this city council and this mayor care more about BS than actually fixing these issues. So please put this in the budget. 
take some money away from this police department, some of these millions, and put it towards actually doing something to help this community. Thank you. So it's not like they don't know. You know, we've been saying it over and over again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually send in one more. Uh, that's that's very similar in nature, and actually, it was during the same call uh, that I stated this to them. I don't know that man, but that was spot on. Um, a couple of things I wanted to address. Uh, first of all, what Kyle just said, I'm hearing more and more and more from outside of my networks and groups about Andy Shore. People are recognizing what you're doing. Uh, it, it is very polarizing. And yes, you're able to uh, move people into positions uh, to get pictures with them. I, as most recently, a flyer went out with Charlie Dean on it. And I just sent Charlie Dean all the information on what you've done in this city. So I'm sure you'll be receiving a call from him eventually to take his face off of that because he really is the people. Uh, but outside of that, um, I've been having conversations with these young people in this city and they're terrified. I mean, they're literally terrified for their lives, riding down the street, going to the store, walking any place after dark. You know, what are you guys going to do about this? I'm, I'm, I'm on here speaking to you guys every single week for the last year and a half about the issues that we have in this city. And repeatedly, I come on here and hear silence uh, from our leadership and the mayor. All we see is pictures and propaganda and no, actually, no actual work at trying to help these young people. I, I task you contact me your third world representative adam contact me let me get some kids in front of you man so they can express to you how fearing for their life they are and you guys wonder why they carry guns around everywhere they go you don't have to deal with that environment i've never ran into andy shore or peter spatter for at kroger's on the south side i've never ran into you at lucky's party store i've never ran into you anywhere these young people have to go so you can't understand the fears that they have from people that look just like them walk in the same neighborhoods in all of those situations I keep bringing here to y'all, begging you, do something for these young people. And that's not $300,000 to advance peace. That's something, anything. Make it a priority amongst you guys. More police don't do nothing but lock more of them up for trying to protect themselves. So you guys wonder why I'm licensing people for CPL? Because they're scared to death out here, so they're gonna carry them anyways. And abstinence does not work amongst our young people. Maybe we educate these kids a little more. Maybe we put some money back into these community organizations that are actually doing this work so we can do the work. That AG, Nestle, uh, her, her stance on what happened in that jail was obviously political. She could have just said she's not gonna charge. That's it, could have been just that. But she killed Anthony Hulon all over again to us, to the whole world, by making his death his fault. No doubtedly, Andy Shore, you had something to do with that. That reeked of you. That reeked of you. You all keep continuing to hide this thing and then the Lansing Police Department posts that with no subject matter just to show the whole world we killed somebody and got away with it. I'll tell you what, you wanna be a murderer and get away with it? Join the ranks of the Lansing Police. So I just wanted to play that for the people uh who are watching this we have to we have to, there's got to be an uprising people have to have to demand change uh i've been by myself in this conversation you know with the elected officials for over a year now um and it's the biggest thing that's affecting us on a daily basis and it's the biggest thing that's uh you know that's that's got us all up in arms at this point is the, is the gun violence is just out of hand so mm -hmm. um we've been you know we've been vocal on it and this was, uh, I think this was maybe two months before or a month before your son was killed. Mm -hmm. And so these people had a chance to act. And that's what I mean by this is that we're giving them every opportunity and all the knowledge they need. And, uh, and it's just, they're just not doing anything about it. So I'm sorry, Judy, I tried everything. I know. We're trying. And we won't stop trying. No, no, we won't. And so I'm not gonna, uh, you know, keep pressing. I'm about to get emotional. Um, I appreciate yeah, you. Thank you. I appreciate thank you coming on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, we're here for you. Absolutely, you know that. Uh, you know, Sherry, who's already stated. You know, could you get a hold of her? You know, just uh, use the phone. You know, stay in mm -hmm. touch with us. I will. Yeah. I will. 
All right. I'll call you Wednesday at three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I needed that. Yes, please do. Wednesday at three o'clock. You yeah, call right. me and let me know how it goes. So okay. Okay. all right. Um, so we're gonna close out our first in studio show. We had Judy Booker here to speak on her son who was murdered uh a month ago. And um, you know, we're we're just here to bring awareness to these things and really and really try to put something in play. So that we don't have any more, you know, uh, mothers that have have to lose somebody, and this this young man has a father too is still out here. Uh, so there's just, uh, you know, this is a very serious issue, and we have had discussion with LSJ. I can tell you that, and I think that um, I think that they understand the wrong in their ways at this point. I'm hoping they do. Uh, you know, we've had some conversation again uh, where they understood that maybe we shouldn't listen to everything that we hear at the same at that one point uh definitely can reach out to me because in most cases as i stated in the audio that you heard i probably know you know the shooter's family or the victim's family you can definitely reach out to me to get that information so therefore all you media out there uh don't be lazy is the best way i can put it and understand just that role and the significance and the responsibility that comes along with those words that many people are going to make an assessment, make judgment and conclusions based upon. And all of that bleeds into how hard the police are willing to work, how they're going to approach it. If the police can not care and say, yeah, I already knew about him. I'm going to step back from this literally. And then the public is like, well, sounds to me like you deserved it. Where does that leave the family? That's your grand baby. Yeah, that's my we grandson. love you, Grandma Judy. I love you too. <laughs> we gotta add that in. <laughs> All right, so uh, Grandma's a strong, strong woman. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, Judy, I appreciate you coming on the show. We will definitely talk again. We actually mm -hmm. are having a show again on Wednesday, eight o'clock. Our shows will be from Monday to Wednesday, Monday and Wednesdays at eight o'clock. Uh, the new format, we're going to talk about that, the new schedule, uh, people that we have coming on the show. Uh, so we're going to be really bringing some heavy hitters and talk about these issues that are going on. Just so you all know, uh, all of the electoral candidates are going to we're going to be putting out uh, requests for them to come on here. So they'll be they'll get to come on here and actually answer to some of this stuff that's going on. Talk about their plans for. Yeah, all of this. I can give you some names of people that I know won't show up, but that's fine. We're not looking so for them fine. anyway. So they'll we want to know. Anyway. Yeah, they'll be invited, but I know they're not going to show. But. I know some candidates that can't wait to get in that seat right there and be able to talk on what they plan to do about this stuff. So we'll be putting some pressure on. Uh, I, I've noticed that, and I'll say this live while he's watching, actually. I've got a joystick on Andy Short back. When I do something and say something, he moves. Even though he don't think he do, he moves. All of this stuff that he's doing right now is because of the conversation that we've been having out here about him in there. So maybe we do get some push on this from the conversation we're saying. I hope so. I All just, right. I, I just need some justice, some peace. We we'll deserve it. some closure. You deserve we'll get that. it. We'll get Thank it. Thank you. All right, you guys. We appreciate y'all coming in on our Monday show. We love y'all, fam. Make sure y'all check us out at america 20 lifecom uh, As you can see, we have merch. You can catch us there. Uh, Cash app up top. If you guys appreciated the show, make sure you come back, like, and follow America Twenty Life on Facebook. Also, we're on Instagram. T-shirts available, all of that good stuff. Uh, this is, you know, this is independent media. We don't got the big bucks that all the big media organizations have, but we will bring you the real. That's a fact. So mm -hmm. anything else y'all have to say? No, thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry, for coming on and, and talking about Richard. You yeah. both are just phenomenally strong human beings. <laughs> yeah. So as I always tell y'all, I hope to talk to you and not about you. Uh, Andy knows what it feels like to get talked about, but peace out, y'all.